Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Okay. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker. And I'm your co-host, Hugh Pope. So in the studio with us today is Angelina Eichhorst. She is the acting managing director for Europe and Central Asia and the director for Western Europe, uh, Western Balkans and Turkey at the European External Action Service. Welcome. Thank you very much. Angelina, you have been helping to mediate the Serbio-Kosovo relationship for quite some time. Lately, we've been hearing that there's movement or perhaps there isn't movement. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on right now and what the prospects are? Sure. So the European Union is facilitating mm -hmm. the dialogue. We call it belgrade Pristina dialogue since uh, 2011. My predecessors, Robert Cooper and Fernando Gentilini, both were very much deeply engaged in all the talks between the two sides, as I was mm -hmm. until actually until today both uh, servicing HRVP Cathy Ashton uh -huh. and then Federica Mogherini today. And hopefully our new high yeah. representative when he takes office. This is a process, I think what makes it very, very special, it's the only process where the EU is the facilitator and where there are a lot of incentives to get the two to talk mm -hmm. and to work out their differences. And this has worked for quite a while, I must say, because they concluded so far, well, at least more than 30 agreements Small agreements, mm -hmm. technical agreements sometimes, but everything is really political in that whole dialogue. What we saw last year, I think it's now almost a year ago, one side, Pristina, that decided mm -hmm. to put tariffs on goods which come in from Serbia and Bosnia and Herzegovina. And the reaction from the other side was, we don't come to the table. So we have now for a year already tried to get the parties back to the table. It's not happening. And that makes it really very difficult, as you know, in any negotiation. You really need the parties to get back to the table. And are the tariffs at the heart of the issue, or is it really something else? At the heart of the issue is that both sides need to come up or work out a final, final agreement. We would call it a legally binding mm -hmm. agreement that resolves all the outstanding issues. So you really go deep in the heart of the matter between the two. They have exhausted a lot of diplomatic uh, talks, negotiations, mm -hmm. tracks facilitated by us on a number of areas. But now it's really about where do we end up together? And it's always when you get really deep into the negotiations, it becomes most difficult. There were internal political reasons in Kosovo, why the prime minister took actions, why the government took actions at the time. Today, because there have been elections in Kosovo, I hope really that we can have a new start with a new government in Kosovo and that we can get the talks uh, starting again. So a year or so ago, there was talk of a land swap. Is that still on the table? There were a lot of talks about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But the point is that both need to agree, as I said, on all the outstanding issues. So they will, in the final, final setup, they need to agree on how do they work with each other and in which setup as such. I'm very carefully choosing the words because I don't go into particularly labeling of what could possibly be part of the, mm -hmm. of the agreement. And when we say they need to resolve everything, it's really everything. That's outstanding. Mm -hmm. So recognition, territorial claims. Everything they want to put on the table has to be there. You need to resolve the issues. You cannot leave on and on and on for years and years. Issues coming back, you, you get into a frozen conflict which is not good, on the south flank of our mm -hmm. borders, of our own, of the European Union, in an, in an area where you really would like to see prosperity, progress, development. The Balkans have a European perspective. We will come to that, yes. I guess, later. It's really, really important that they resolve their relations with their neighbours. Is the Pristina belgrade dialogue the brightest hope you have in the Balkans at the moment? I mean, we've had ups and downs. Where is your main source of hope for the future of this perspective that you call? At one point, there was a lot of hope, and I'll always keep hope because we are diplomats. But hope doesn't make really plans and doesn't always give the results. But there was a lot of 
will and space to actually make those things happen between Belgrade and Pristina at some point, particularly when we saw Prespa, when we saw that Skopje and Athens came to a final agreement on their outstanding issues. We thought, okay, let's, you know, we keep the dynamic of resolving good neighborly relations. You know, we keep on working and we keep that steam going. Today, it's different because you still need to get the parties to the table. For that, you need to have the leverage, you need to have the trust, you need to have all the diplomacy working. And we are a little bit at the crossroads of where can we go now with the Balkans, and you know why that is. So I keep the hope because there is really no alternative for the Balkans Mm -hmm. than being fully, fully integrated part of the continent and functioning within the framework as we're having it for the European Union. Geographically, historically, there's no other space there. Does that mean eventual membership or does that mean something else? And has that changed? In all the work we have been doing, and when we talk about European perspective, we talk about membership. We don't talk about anything else but membership. The fact is that there are so many questions about how does this process really work Is it really still attractive? Does it really, really help the transformation we all want to see? These are questions which are today on the table. They were perhaps less on the table in the past, and they need to be addressed. But it is important that, and I think all member states agree as well, that we need to keep that perspective really alive as much as possible, that people who are in the Balkans seeing that they have a future in the European Union. These are countries and partners where 80% of the people really feel they are already part of the EU. They feel it Mm -hmm. and they want to be part of the European Union. So for us, it's membership. I think the disappointment you're referring to is certainly the North Macedonia issue, where suddenly, after many encouragements, the road appeared to be blocked. There have been some movement in those Western Balkan countries to try and do things on their own. What kind of ways are you finding to keep their hopes of this European integration alive? You say it's doing things on their own. When we see that there is regional initiative, Mm -hmm. thinking, work, gathering, putting things together, the cooking of the kitchen, we are actually really happy about that because... You have a region where, and this is what uh, High Representative Mogherini always said, the leaders wouldn't meet with each other three years ago. They wouldn't sit around the table. Now they do very regularly, almost every week. And they have a lot of issues to discuss about. We can see that they are also saying, okay, what is our best way to make our economies work, to have a free movement of people, of goods, of services, of capital to look at? This is all fine because it all falls within what we would call the the aki. Okay, it's a buzzword, but it is very important. Mm-hmm. It would fall within the whole framework of what the European Union stands for. So if there are not different but special initiatives or special intention to work together, we only welcome that. The point is that a lot of work, and people don't see that in, immediately, has been done already on the ground when it comes to transformation economically, socially, politically, culturally. So when you then see suddenly leaders getting together as such and the European Union is not there at the table, then people start asking questions. But for us, it's only natural this happens as such. Mm -hmm. So that's an interesting point you make. And it's something I've thought a lot about when I look at the Balkans is there has been so much foreign involvement in the minutia of resolving conflicts, of planning reforms. There are economies that are extremely dependent, in fact, on these programs of European assistance, Western foundations. Are you seeing a bit of indigenization in a real way? Is it a shift? And why not? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not sure it's a shift, but it's sort of the coming out of all these years of investment. And as you say, Mm -hmm. I mean, nowhere else than in the Balkans, we have been investing so much. I'm not talking financially, I'm talking in terms of the diplomatic work, the security, all the instruments and all the all the issues we have at hand to use within the European Union. We deployed it in the Balkans and we still do. And for good reasons. Now, seeing that sort of being used, because many of the leaders tell us this is about us. It's about them. This is good. We welcome that. What we don't really welcome is that you have constantly new initiatives on the regional level. You know, these initiatives came up within the European Union. We had Commissioner Hahn always saying, look, I think there were like over 90 sort of regional frameworks happening in that small region. It's a little bit, right? Yeah, I can see you love. It's quite a lot. So let's streamline and make it more efficient. Every citizen with their own initiative. (laughs) Yeah, as long as the compass is there and it leads to 
what people down there would like to achieve. It's not really about what the EU mm-hmm. wants. It's what people themselves would like to achieve together. I think that's great. Have you seen any dialing down of the international competition that used to really poison things in the Balkans? That's a very good question because there's so much talk about different players in the region. The point is that it's all about who can get the first headline on the newspaper, in the media or on the social media. And then you get sort of an idea that, ah, suddenly there are different players around doing on their chessboard. The European Union has been there from the very, very start until today in the most massive way possible in terms of investment, economic, cooperation, the whole list. But that doesn't come every day in the headlines, right? So when others come in or when other leaders visit, non-European or elsewhere, obviously this feeds into a narrative that, oh, the EU is leaving us and we are now left to others. Personally, from the experience we are having on the ground with all the people we work with, is really we can see that it's not that there is no reason for concern, but what we need to continue to show is that this is about European Union present there, people present there who feel European that feeling of we are part of the EU as Mm -hmm. such. If that doesn't happen, so when spaces are being left or filled or not filled, then others come in with the megaphone and then we have a lot of analysis that go around. I'm not too worried about it. What I would like is that the message of the European Union remains very firm and very solid and very clear. So is your sense that the trend lines are towards stability and general improvement, or should we be worried, Um, or both? No. When you look at today, 2019, and let's say five years ago, I would say the trend is absolutely positive. But people forget where the different partners and countries were Mm -hmm. five years ago. We don't look at that anymore. We forget, even if it's a short history, that that piece of the knowledge is usually missing in the analysis, which is unfortunate. So we always try to look back, and countries, they tell us, people tell us themselves, look, we see, and it's not that I particularly want to take out one of the six, but just take any any of those. The progress has been tremendous, and we want to keep that as such, but people just don't see it. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and we're talking to Angelina Eichhorst of the European External Action Service. Angelina, I want to change direction just a little bit because you've also spent a lot of time working on Turkey issues and Turkey EU relations, and that has been a fraught path, let's say. What lessons should we take going forward, either in the Western Balkans or with other partners of the European Union? What lessons can be learned from the experience with Turkey? It's a very complex question. It's a very tricky question as such, because we all know where we are today in a relationship that lacks, if you like, clarity at all levels. There's a lot of good political will to make sure that the relationship European Union-Turkey is beneficial for all. But then you also need to have the right signals at all levels. And diplomats, we work with signals, we work with our interaction, we do the analysis, we do the judgment, and we try to see where are the different sort of points we really, really need to focus on much more. And for the moment, there's far less to work with than before with Turkey, Mm -hmm. because Turkey actually is that very country where I said earlier in the Balkan we deployed all our instruments. But if you look at our deep relationship, European Union, Turkey, it's so vast. It's also very long standing, longest candidate country, NATO member as well. So we have also have the security in there. Today, I believe that the question really is where can we find in our relationship the elements we can really work with where we find it's a win-win for both and where all the nuisances we have on our different sides what can we still make out of this because European Union wants to have a good relationship Mm -hmm. with Turkey of course Turkey is a candidate country but Turkey is very important in all our relations for the region as such as well but also it's about the internality what does the Turkish leadership want for the Turkish people Right. What is the vision for your country in the future? Can we make sure that we are in that neighboring relationship and in the relationship we have, we can get the best out of it? 
it keeps us quite busy. You're absolutely right, particularly with what happened recently in North Syria, but even before what happened in the East Mediterranean and elsewhere. You saw the reactions of the member states of the European Union. Where are the positives in all of this? Where are still the positive elements we can work with? Where are they? <laughs> we are working on the whole spectrum of the relations. I mean, such. the Syrian refugee crisis seemed to be an area where at least there was an agreement reached, though it's remained a bit tense. What do you think are the prospects going forward, particularly given how Turkey's involvement in Syria has evolved? I'm not sure that enough people in Europe realize when you host three and a half million, four million refugees, how much it does to your country. Absolutely. And you can have 100 million people living in the country, 50 or elsewhere. You know, I served in Lebanon. I know how very, very difficult it is when almost half of your population consists of refugees who have exactly mm -hmm. the daily needs like everybody else has. And for Turkey hosting, we've always said how important it is. We have facilitated the finances for it. We will continue to do so as EU. But this is a very, very important element to keep in mind. Sometimes people forget. And I believe that should be at least part of the list. That's basically number one where we say it's very, very important to recognize the responsibility Turkey has been taking. Would you say that the six billion euros has been well spent then? The six billion Yours is this is the 6 billion euros that Europe had provided Turkey to help with uh, the care and feeding and support yeah, of the refugees. We have member states have made available and also from the budget 2 times 3 billion mm -hmm. as such, which is a vast number. It's not enough as such. But we have decided to help through the United Nations and through civil society and other organizations on the ground in Turkey to provide for the basic needs and protection for almost 4 million refugees. We believe it's well spent because it goes directly into the needs of the refugees. It's also a mechanism or it is a way of spending that actually has had a very different way of working, like quick spending, as efficient and as, well, as I said, as fast as possible. I'm saying it because it's quite unusual. Usually it takes a lot more time to mobilize and get this money going from the EU. And that money the way it has been spent so far, that is really well spent. The point is that Turkey always says it's not enough or it is too slow or it doesn't go where it is. But we can see it with all the assistance that has been provided that it has really met the purpose. More money is needed because the refugees are still there. So you have these positive things going on at the same time as the problems you're talking about. You've spoken of the disappointment of... European leaders, especially towards the Turkish contestation of the oil and gas fields around Cyprus, I think you were referring to just now. And you spoke of signals that you wanted to see from Turkey. What signals from Turkey do you think would persuade European leaders that it was time to get engaged or to renew that effort with Turkey? Well, for one, and it comes always back to the work we do as diplomats, you want to see the conversation going on the issues where we would normally deport. And if there are ships in the eastern Mediterranean that enter contested water, then obviously that is a situation we, as European Union, we cannot afford. This is the security of the European Union comes at stake. And then obviously you don't want to have signals that go into threatening the security of the European Union. You're referring to open the borders and send the refugees in? But these are statements which I find extremely unhelpful. We understand why they're being made. They're being made also basically for inside Turkey. Mm -hmm. But this is not something we, if we really want to look at the positives, as I said, can work with. I call it the megaphone. What is much more needed is on a basis of respect for each other, of trust also of each other, that you have the conversation going on the issues where you actually do seem to differ. Then you need to have that dialogue, that work together as such. One of the things that I remember from my 30 years in Turkey was the, one of the happiest days in the whole time. There was that day in December 1999 that Turkey became an official candidate to join the European Union. The front pages of the Turkish press were cleared and it was a beautiful moment of happy faces and happy editorials, and a real sense of mm. purpose in Turkey. 20 years later, it's a completely different picture. The front pages have changed. There's extraordinary statements being made about Europe. And yet, Half of the population in Turkey doesn't vote with the current government. How does, in your job, in your work, how do you keep alive the hopes of 
possibly that still rather significant section of Turkish population that does still look to Europe and want European perspective of some kind. But what you're saying about half more or less of the population, I believe that's crucial. It's extremely important that we continue to work with the people who feel that, okay, I understand your interests, I understand your values, uh, this is the way of life I would like to share as well. You know, you can call it the European way of life, I don't need to brand it like that, but it's more that you really feel you're very, very close to the people, and I'm convinced we are. But at this point in, in time, to get that message across inside Turkey is a huge challenge for us, but also I feel mostly for the people there because we know very well that the space for free media has been shrinking quite substantially and you still want people to see and to hear and to feel. The other issue is that because we don't have the full visa liberalization with mm -hmm. Turkey, that a lot of people who would like to have their business contacts ongoing, the study, the research, the exchanges, which are very, very important for the people in Turkey, for the moment, it cannot happen because of an absence of visa liberalization. No, it's absolutely scandalous that people have to wait for months and go through an absolutely dragnet of uh, procedures to get their visas, don't they? You know, I say this also with you as a citizen. I find it extremely difficult. I worked enough abroad in countries where people who really, really have very close ties w with the continent cannot easily mm -hmm. visit. We are talking about visits. We are not talking about coming to establish themselves inside the European Union. We're talking about very crucial exchanges. And particularly, I think of a young generation of students and others who want, as any other students in the continent and across the world want to travel and see and experience. All of that to me, it comes in that frame, that package of where can we work as people together on all these positive elements we share and we share so much together. That's also why Turkey keeps us so busy. I feel we have to be in a way, we have to never lose the sight of the over time extreme importance of our relations European Union and Turkey. We should not look at very short-term difficulties we're having. That's very, very important. But I say it also because our starting point should be the people in Turkey and the people living in the continent of at least keeping those ties very closely together. Are you optimistic? <laughs> as they always say, as a diplomat, you cannot do your job without being optimistic. I'm also realistic how difficult it is. What I need, what I hope, what I look forward to is the courage, it's the vision. It's also the realization of, look, what does it get us here at this point in time when we have really difficult relationships together? Can we not solve this? I believe in the table. I love this table. I love the shape you have here. But in any table where people are sitting and working their differences out, I believe we can do that also with Turkey. But we need to get the table working again. While you're doing that, do you sometimes feel that you wish you had another instrument or another shape table, as it were, because the accession process, the whole idea that Turkey is going to become a full member of the European Union, which was, wasn't probably the idea in 1959 when this all started, this idea of a really tight sharing and pooling of sovereignty, which my experience of Turkey is that many people in Turkey don't want, and it's clear that in Europe there's a lot of hesitation about it as well. Mm. Don't you wish that there was some way to have an alternative shape of the table to be sitting around? I believe in alternatives if you have exhausted the direction, the navigation you wanted to in the first place. When there's really no other way, you always need to have your plan B, C and D. Uh, many would say we don't have B, C and D because plan B is plan A. But we have not yet exhausted. We have not yet had the full deep, deep, deep discussion on where does our relationship begin and where does it end. And I think that is important as such. So I'm, I can venture a lot on alternatives of relationships also politically and elsewhere. And they may just be shaped while we are sitting here. It's all very possible. But for the moment, if we look at where our interests are as the European Union, and if we look at Turkey or the Balkan elsewhere, where their interests are, then the only way I can see is that we really, really shape this together and not uh, at different tables. 
Angelina Eichhorst, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in to War and Peace. Big thanks also to Antoine Leroux of Bull Media, who is our producer. Thank you to Miranda Sonnex, who makes sure that he and I have what we need every time we walk into the studio. And we will talk to all of you again in two weeks. Thanks for tuning in. This is Hugh Pope signing off and asking you to look at uh, crisisgroup.org for any of the topics that we've been discussing, the Western Balkans, especially Turkey. We have a lot of reports and other publications uh, for you to read. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.